All right, well, let's get going and we'll let the few stragglers join us as they come in. Um, my name is Tanya Richards, everybody. My uh, pronouns are she, her. I am the founder of a, a boutique event management agency here in Vancouver called Collective X. So basically that means I'm currently unemployed, <laughs> but I have the privilege of being the director of the SMCC Vancouver chapter and the honor of being your moderator today. Uh, before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that I am broadcasting to you all from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen, Keitsi, Samyamu, and First Nations. Um, I also acknowledge that many others joining today may be on different territories. So I have a few housekeeping sessions to get into today. First, even though we've been at this for over a year, if you're having any technical issues, check your audio settings for your speaker settings. If you're having anything else, please send us a note on the Q&A and our trustee team will help you out. Just a note on the Q&A in general, we're not gonna use the Q&A today for your actual questions and answers. We're gonna ask you to hold off on those until we actually take to Clubhouse in about 40 minutes, and then we will pull you up on stage and you can actually ask your questions directly to the panelists today. That being said, if you're on an Android and or can't join us later, please uh, feel free to send a Q&A and we'll see if we can get to it for you. Uh, in regards to using Clubhouse, if you haven't done so already, please go onto the app now, find SMCC, give us a follow, in the, in the actual, um, in their profile, you'll see the alert button. Click on that to always, just to make sure that you see that room pop up immediately when we get to that uh, platform. Also take a moment to find all of our panelists today, give us a follow so that you can stay in touch with us moving forward. And again, uh, if you do have an Android phone, and but you have a Mac or an iPad or anything else in your uh, discretion or at your availability, please feel free to join that way. Uh, finally, you know, what kind of sponsorship uh, group would we be if we don't take a moment to say, thank our sponsors? So here are our foundational partners. These guys are amazing at making sure that we stay operational and that we can host events such as these for you uh, in a free format. And finally, at the end of every um, webinar, we will send you a uh, post-event survey. We'll send that via email, but if you'd like to take a minute here, feel free to take a snapshot of the QR code and you can send us some feedback in, in real time. So. Without further ado, I'm really excited to say we have a large group that has joined us here today. So I think what is fair to say is that there's a lot of interest, curiosity, or honestly not knowing what Clubhouse is. So hopefully today we'll be able to give you a bit more of a background. So what is it? Obviously you've heard the hype, maybe you've joined, maybe you're one of the 9.5 million people that jumped on the bandwagon in February. Perhaps you're loving it, or honestly, maybe you're looking at this thing going, what is this? I really don't get it. I don't get the um, infatuation with it. So we're going to dig deeper into that. But by definition, just so everybody understands what Clubhouse is, uh, it's an invitation only social media app specifically for iOS, iOS users only at this time. It's an auditory communication tool, and they, we use rooms to host up to 5,000 people. Um, the audio only app hosts virtual rooms for live discussions and it obviously gives people the opportunity to speak or or just listen depending on your mood or your interest. Um, Clubhouse has stated that it is going to remain invite only to ensure its team is able to manage the growth of its user base and to continue to refine the app to be capable of supporting larger audiences and Clubhouse does have plans to extend its accessibility and is currently working on an Android version. Uh, currently there's conversations, or currently the conversations on Clubhouse are prohibited from being recorded, transcribed, reproduced, or shared without explicit permission. Um, this has obviously been a source of controversy for the app. Uh, it opens its doors for um, opportunities of bullying, harassment, and obviously racism, but it also limits the capabilities and like potential functionality for, for marketers like us to use. And finally, it is also worth noting that Clubhouse has been criticized for its inherent privacy issues and countries such as Jordan and China have blocked or completely banned the app from being used. But clearly it's doing something right because Facebook, Twitter, Discord, Spotify, Reddit, and Slack are all actively working on creating a, a product to complete to compete with Clubhouse. So there is a huge demand for this type of app right now. So let's dive right in. First off the bat, our first panelist, um, Mark clearly needs no introduction to the majority of the audience today, but Mark, just to feed your ego a little bit, let's give it a try. Uh, Mark is clearly, um, or of course, an industry veteran of the sponsorship and experiential industry. He's a purpose-driven entrepreneur. He's the founder of the T1 agency and now global sponsorship conference, Sponsorship X. He's an established author, speaker, and now advocate. 
Mark recently founded the Black Talent Initiative, a movement dedicated to creating opportunities for young Black Canadians in the work, uh, workplace. Over the past several months, Mark's chaired the Ontario University Athletics Task Force on Black, Biracial and Indigenous Issues, volunteered for organizations such as Black, Blacks in Sport, Business, excuse me, and his agency has been doing pro bono work for Black Opportunity Fund. And I believe, Mark, you're actually on a panel with SNCC next month to dig a little deeper into this, which I'm really excited about. And of course, as a side hustle, no big deal, Mark co-founded Park Street Education, the first remote learning school for, of its kind, which ensures children have access to be inclusive and, uh, and a consistent education. And Mark is a board member or uh, board of directors at Big Brothers and Big Sisters Canada and a volunteer at CA CMAH Foundation. And for those out West, that's the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Mark, did I miss anything? I washed my hair this morning. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm stealing somebody else's line. Sorry, Michelle. Uh, okay, so Mark, anybody who knows you knows that you've always been an early adopter. Um, obviously, you created an experiential marketing agency before we even coined the term in our, our industry. You blogged when nobody read blogs. You started a podcast before it was easy to self-stream. So it wasn't surprising to me that you were one of the first to join the Clubhouse movement. What was it originally about the app that drew you in and how has its appeal or the evolution of it over the last few months changed for you? Or I guess really what I'm asking you is what is the core value that this app is bringing for you personally and more importantly, professionally? And you forgot that according to Peter Cosentino, I'm the first person who faxed out an industry newsletter. Um, <laughs> but none of you know what a fax machine is. So we'll deal with that in our next, club, our next conversation. Um, in the beginning, it was pure jealousy. I mean, this app has grown from 10,000 users in September to 10 million. And as we were discussing in the pre-show, now people are auctioning off those invites on eBay. One guy I saw for $3,500. But I'll, I'll, my own journey, I got on very early in January. So I was originally, I heard about it in November, December, um, and was a bit jealous of those who'd been on the early invite list. And I think this invite only mythology has worked well. And then I, I went through my own chain. So I actually had a business partner in, in Holland who, who added me. And I would say early on for me, it was a little bit of fanboy. There were all these high profile people on there, um, sort of jumping into these big rooms. I got flattered when I got asked to be up on a stage. But now today I kind of look at it really in three simple ways. One is I'm meeting new and, and very interesting people. So since a lot of us are Canadians on here, I'd, I'd encourage you to jump into Canadians connecting with Canadians on Clubhouse. Mondays and Wednesdays, it's all business. And Friday, because we're stuck at home, at least we are in Toronto, it's a party. Um, and a little bit like crazy, everything from people auditioning for music producers to people building networks to a lot of uh, group. I find it unbelievable focus grouping because you can figure out any topic in the world and you can just jump in there and literally be a fly on the wall and hear about um, consumer sentiment. And then, and then thirdly, uh, for me, I think it's just an unbelievable opportunity to actually create the modern par party line. So I'll hold closed group rooms with people who are my friends. So I think about my, here goes Tanya, my Steelers pals, because you'd said, how long is it going to take for Harrison to bring up the Steelers? Um, six Super Bowls for those who are counting on this Zoom. Um, but, you know, instead of just texting, now we can have a closed room and talk about things. So those are the three, the three things I see today. I love that you said, um, so people focus group. And originally you were talking the other day about um, using the, the app to find communities for your clients. Can you tell us a bit about that? What did that mean? So I think there's two things here. Um, and I think one of the big discussion points we should have today is, is about brands. Is There are, if we think about the world today, we've gone from you know, marketing demographics, male or female, with kids, without kids. Now, and thank you, by the way, I actually just want to back up. I actually want to thank you for making the land acknowledgement. One of the things you talked about is I've been in this business for a long time and I'm actually embarrassed that for decades we've held events and activities on indigenous lands and haven't acknowledged the people that provide us the opportunity to. So I just wanted to jump back to that. For our clients, what we're trying to do now is understand where are those uber passionate consumers, those key, those micro influencers, I was gonna say key influencers that maybe we don't know about and those nuggets, those little gems 
that exist out there that give us insights in how to connect with them. So one thing I love about Clubhouse, unlike text, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, I think it's the most raw, unpolished, true communication or portrayal of how people are feeling. Well, I think that to me is part of the beauty of it. I, lo I love that it is, or, you know, just this raw communication. And although I think it tells you in etiquette rules to not swear and stuff, like people are really just being their true selves in these rooms and you, you just kind of get to speak your mind. Um, Mark, finally, my last question for you is you're obviously using this tool now. You've created your own room um, or club, sorry. Can you tell us a bit about that and how it's working for you or not working? Well, um, as you well know, because you were a part of them in the early days and you've attended them later days, you know, Sponsorship X, the X stands for experience, like it does in your company's name. And that is about immersing our delegates in the live experience. So we were supposed to be in Tokyo last summer doing Sponsorship X along with the Canadian Olympic Committee. Then we pivoted to webinars like many did. And this year we just said, you know, the webinars are great. They're a fair bit of work. Let's try Clubhouse. And so what we love about Clubhouse is it's easy to set up, it's organic. Today we had, you know, uh, the Baltimore Ravens, the Steelers, the Buffalo Bills, the LA Rams, and Ethel Canada on, on a session. And so we're continuing to build with Sponsorship X. You also mentioned the Black Talent Initiative, which is a not-for-profit that I've launched along with 60 of my best friends to help create hope and opportunity for Black Canadians. And we're actually going to soon launching a Black Talent Initiative Clubhouse Room as well. So for me, I just find it a really easy way to build community. And, and so it's, it's working. Be candid, I don't think it's working as well as I thought it would because one of the flaws with Clubhouse, I think everybody here will acknowledge, is a real, I guess I'm not allowed to swear here, the real star, I mentioned fanboy. There's a real, you know, you see the rooms that get Elon Musk showing up and people go to them. So for me, I'm sort of taking the approach of we'll just build our room one person, one topic at a time. I'm not here to kind of, you know, try to pat my ego. Um, since you already did, thanks, that was great, uh, with, with more numbers. But really for us, it probably hasn't, I don't know if the audience has been as large as we wanted, but I'll tell you, um, I've actually created two potential business opportunities out of it just because people find you they they pounce on your insta or, or linkedin and then you connect and uh, and and i probably met 10 people who i would say that if i was in international hiring mode i'd be like these are great people so those are great outcomes fair thank you for that Okay, next let's go to um, Atif Saad. I hope I said that right. I'm really excited to have Atif today because he's not part of our sponsorship driven um, industry. Atif is the go-to digital guy in Vancouver. He's a strategist and entrepreneur. Um, today, he is the founder of the digital agency Analog Plus Digital. He was a recipient of the top 25 under 25 award from the city of Surrey and he won Post Capital Savings Top Small Business Award. When he's not working on his laptop, you can find him on Clubhouse. Uh, in his spare time, Atif helped start the Vancouver-based Creatives Club on Clubhouse, which he's going to tell us about. So first off, Atif, you are the digital expert here today. So I'm hoping that you can actually better explain to us uh, what Clubhouse truly is. I certainly didn't do it any justice. And then can you tell us a bit about um, what the Vancouver-based creative group is, who's on it, who are its members, what are you guys talking about, what kind of values is it bringing? Yeah, um, it's great to just meet everyone as well, too. Um, and just going right into it, too, uh, Mark actually hit the point on where I feel like Clubhouse has really hit his niche as a social platform. It's definitely created itself in a lane where um, when you think about Twitter and all these other platforms, too, there's a lot of trolling, whereas like Clubhouse has kind of built that space where it's very transparent. Um, and to give context to like the early days, so I've been on Clubhouse since I think it was like September of last year. Um, and then even before that, my partner, uh, Hu Tan, who actually, we both created a group. He was on Clubhouse since like February. Um, and what was happening like in the early days was like, it was actually a lot of creatives uh, that were just getting put onto the platform for them to just like connect, start talking about like, hey, like let's start making like music and those things. And that's hence how we actually decided in the first place, like, oh, let's just register it as like Vancouver based creatives. Um, but I think just going back to it too, um, it's a really good platform for just connecting and meeting people. And as we started creating this group called Vancouver based creatives, we just noticed how um, 
and I'm I, being from Vancouver and I'm sure some of the people in the audience are too. It's like Vancouver just has this culture where people say it's hard to meet people. Uh, and that was like the direction that we decided to just push towards with, with Clubhouse. So with Vancouver based creatives, we decided to like push that lane and then start going into areas where it was like, hey, how can we maybe treat Clubhouse as a vocal newspaper? Um, and to tie back to like how Mark was saying, it's like there's so many different niches that like Clubhouse can go towards is like whether if you were thinking about podcasting, uh, it might be a good platform where you can start just building an audience all the way to it or to that aspect of like, you know what, like we're talking over emails and there's like, uh, like even what you guys are doing today to move that towards Clubhouse where uh, it just makes it very easy for everyone to finally be in one room and just start communicating. Um, I think overall, I kind of treat it the same way as Mark. It's like, it's been a great space to just actually just meet people, whether it's people that you want to treat as friends or if it is like business acquaintances, um, there's almost like a room for everything. Um, I personally use it for myself on personal use, like being from South Asian background, it was always hard to find people that I looked up to in that area and noted, like, I, I kind of went a route of like creative and like arts, which culturally is like really hard to get your parents to approve on, but like literally finding these rooms of like people being like, Hey, I want that route, but I'm actually like the director of Netflix now, or like just being in the room with those people, everyone kind of like bonding on those areas, uh, it just gets you to like. Uh, look at things from that six degrees of separation, realize like, wow, everyone's actually a lot closer uh, than their one thinks. Um, but I think overall going into like Clubhouse now, um, it's interesting to see because there has been a large, large audience that's joined in. Um, so um, yeah, I think just where the lane is going now too as well, it's, it's probably more towards like podcasting and those sides or even how the NFL just, started like the draft today too. Super cool to see how things are moving around. But yeah, that's what I would put it, yeah. So my question to you is like, obviously being from the, the digital side of it, are you working with your clients and advising them on like how to use social audio uh, marketing right now? Yeah, it's so interesting that you say that. Uh, I feel like we indirectly got leads without trying to get leads on this because I think like one thing that's starting to happen is a lot of brands are starting to realize that there needs to be almost like a vocal side of the branding too now. So whether that is like, let's say a brand and their CEO, uh, it's it's more like, hey, you can now go onto Clubhouse, let's do some interviews, let's find you some rooms where you can actually chat so you can start becoming a thought leader. Or I think the other aspect is like, where we're nosing is uh, like, we're working with two vegan brands right now. So like with their social team, uh, talking about like, hey, how can that social media person be talking about um, Clubhouse? And uh, I mean, on Clubhouse about like, uh, and what are like some of the rules and those things. So I think for right now, it's kind of going more towards that social audio stage of how it's like early days of people realizing that, oh, this should be another extension that we should really start taking serious. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the, that, how it can fit into the marketing mix in general. So let, let's keep going. So next up, we have Eileen. Oh, I'm going to butcher this. McManaman. McManaman. Sorry. Close enough? And nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Eileen is the founder and managing partner of the uh, 5T Sports uh, Group, which is, on, in my opinion, on a mission to make professional sport more sustainable, but while also staying economically viable. Um, Eileen is a board member or a strategic advisor. And in her spare time, she developed and managed multi-sport activations during two Olympic games. Uh, that's, um, that's quite the, the resume, Eileen. Uh, let's dig in. So obviously you're many things, including an activist and a sustainability champion. You're clearly purpose-driven, um, but is it fair to say you, you work in a fairly slow to adapt sports industry? So I'm, I'm really curious, like how are you specifically using Clubhouse um, or more importantly, how do you think Clubhouse can be used to promote your specific objectives and enhance that sort of futuristic perspective we know you for? Yeah, um, no, thanks for that. Actually, I mean, I think the sports industry is doing quite a bit to adapt and it just depends on where you are at in the world, what the emphasis on, on what, they're, uh, what they're attacking on the purpose front, right? In North America, we are much more concerned about social justice, racial justice issues right now um, that are channeling through sport in Europe, a little bit more focused on the climate uh, 
issues, um, you know, and, and I think if we can say there was one good, good thing <laughs> out of this whole past year is that we're, we're all certainly more attuned to how any of these issues affect our day to day. So um, that's certainly helping and you're seeing even more teams um, wield their economic influence uh, to um, recovery. But um, how, how have we seen it? Uh, one, one of the things that is true is that those silos, like I work in all three facets of sustainability, social, economic, and, and environmental, but those have been working in silos for the last number of years. There are people who are just focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, just focused on climate. And part of the beauty of Clubhouse for me is that I can bring those audiences together in what we're doing now. But initially I could dive into all of those topics um, and, and get a, a really good viewpoint uh, from different folks, right? Um, but we have started a, a, a club now in there to say, all right, we're gonna make that one place where you can come and talk to all these different facets of what's going on in sports and what it needs to be in the future. And, and I find that we draw in people who aren't working in this space, but they're working um, you know, as urban planners or, uh, you know, they're, they're working on other initiatives that, that are drawn to it going, wow, that sounds interesting. Let me find out what future proofing sports is. And we find great people coming into the conversation that we wouldn't have met at the conferences that we specifically participate in. So a, a specific question I have for you, because one of the criticisms that I have about Clubhouse is that anybody can sort of position themselves as an expert. And, you know, the conversations you're having we need real experts. We need people that really know what they're talking about. So how do you, what are your recommendations on like, how do you filter through the garbage on there to figure out who really is an expert in this and how can you engage them in those conversations versus who's just positioning themselves potentially? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, one of the reasons that I went into clubhouse initially wasn't for, for marketing or, or even, you know, uh, even directly in my space, it was because I was interested in learning a little bit more about certain technologies because I wanted to improve my impact investing personally. So I started diving into different rooms that would guide me toward, again, social enterprises or, you know, people working in things like clean tech. Uh, and so I, you know, a little bit of cherry picking, but yeah, I mean, there is, there is some issue with having to scroll through uh, what's going on. I would love to see, um, you know, a little bit more of a search function. I, I think I initially thought there would be a bit more AI in showing me what, uh, what I was interested in, given that I was picking off the topics. Um, but I have found I'm still seeing a, a feed. If I'm trolling through, I'm just still seeing a feed of a lot of things. So uh, what is helpful though, is how people do use the emojis to kind of give you that visual cue and go, Oh, there's a little earth or a little plant. Okay, so that's an that's an environmental thing, or uh, you know whatever it is. So, uh, but yeah, I think I think there's a little work to be done to troll through that. So, do you do you have an official club now? I do. It's it's called Future Proofing Sports, and and we um we actually take different lenses. The three that I mentioned, plus, and sometimes it'll be even more focused. Um, like the, the whole athlete experience, the whole mental health and wellness and, and long-term, you know, that Canada was very good with their long-term athlete development programs so, that are globally leading. And I think that that kind of initiative needs to be brought out more uh, to talk about just keeping people healthy and active, uh, but also taking care of athletes all the way through from, from grassroots to not be, you know, opposed to crazy coaches or, or hopefully not abusive coaches, but all the way into, you know, a professional athlete who's retired and maybe struggling. So, so I find we kept it broad enough to keep a, keep a, a good assortment of people coming through. Excellent. So it's a good reminder to everybody out there listening now that when you find, take a moment to find all of our panelists today, set your alert um, function on so that when they're on, you can, you can see the conversations they're having and when their rooms are active and, and join some of these conversations. So next up, we have Michelle Collins. Um, I, from my personal opinion, Michelle has literally the best gig in Vancouver. She is the senior manager of sport hosting Vancouver. And what that means is she's leading the team behind the team, bringing major national and international events to Vancouver. Uh, obviously these events not only, you know, animate um, the destination, they employ many of us on this call, uh, and they put Vancouver on a map for visitors and building our local economy. So some of these events, which I absolutely love are, you know, Rugby Sevens, World Juniors, Olympic Qualifiers. 
Michelle, is it safe to say that if anybody in the audience right now has an idea for an event uh, or would like to partner, you're the person that they go to? You got it. <laughs> um, in addition, Michelle, uh, in addition to working for the city, Michelle is also the chair uh, of the Minister's Tourism Engagement Council. She's a proud UBC Thunderbird, serving the Alumni Advisory Council, and is the second ever female to be appointed the president of the BC Golf Association. I didn't know that. Does that mean you have like a mean swing? Um, no, it means that I'm learning the game and I appreciate it every time. I am the voice of those who did not grow up in the game, but want to transition into it later. So That's I'm awesome. excited for this opportunity. I, I love the game now. I go from activity now and I am playing the game now. So. Okay, well, when I say, we're going to hit the links with you. Um, okay, so you bring a completely different perspective, which I want to uh, dive into a little bit. So most of the rest of us on this panel um, want to be easily accessible through social media. Obviously, it's part of our business needs, it's business development opportunities for us. I'm assuming this might not be the same in your case. Can you tell us a bit about what are the positives and negatives of being viewed as a city representative on social channels? And what is it like um, when you join these conversations with like all of us regular folk and like, dare I say, the riffraff of Clubhouse, you know, getting an opportunity to talk to you? Yeah, like I think I think there's different ways of looking at it. As a as a public servant, I do have to be very conscious as to how I'm portraying, how I'm inviting, like, and 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 first and foremost, because of that too, like I've been educated in other ways. So for for Mark, for you, I'm I'm coming from the North Shore here and on the traditional territories of the Slaywatooth, and that will be always acknowledged. And you know, for my presentation of myself, um, I, I just have to be very conscious as to what viewpoints I'm taking in and what I'm sharing back. So for me, it's a it's a two way conversation. And my excitement about this tool, and it can't be my only tool because there is exclusivity in this. And as someone in the public, you know, we want to make sure that we are as inclusive as possible and being able to get all points of view um, using many different tools because I think every demographic has different access and what interests them. My excitement for this tool is that it reaches a different age category that has not participated in public engagement in the traditional forms. And, you know, what, where I got introduced to this was more so, I, I saw Carm from the Daily Hive posting, you know, stories about what is happening in council um, and more so about the Granville Street District and things that would interest and people understanding the process. And I can see him tweeting our councillors to say, join it, you need to listen. Um, and that's where I logged in and I got excited because we do have some younger councillors now um, that are trying to get a full perspective as opposed to the traditional methods of showing up to a council meeting. Um, you know, those that have their opinions of no show up, those that sometimes have their opinions of yes, or it's common sense, I don't need to say anything. And unfortunately, we need that voice to come and reassure council that they're making good decisions or are listening to the next generation of Vancouver growing up too. I actually got a chance to, to join some of Carm's conversations on, on Granville Street of spending a decade of my life Especially on that on that street, um, and so I, I applaud Carm for the contribution he's making. But it was actually really great to see we had three council members join that conversation and see that engagement factor. So for me, as a citizen uh, or a voter, it's a phenomenal tool to be able to have a direct contact with um, city representatives. I'm just looking at like you know what is some of the exposure here? Like what are some of the negatives that come with it? Or on the flip side, like how do you think this tool can be used in the public? Or sorry, in the in the public sector to like actually better engage with its constituents and get like I know you just said it brings the younger audience, but how how can we use this tool to like actually progressively move a conversation that we would normally never be able to have? And not that it's not that we can't normally have it because we can we, we need to always be accessible for someone to email me to state state their opinion, and I'm always going to have to get back to them. Um, I think the the best thing I've been ever told is. I have to be prepared for anything I put in writing or that I say is going to be on the front cover of the Vancouver Sun. And am I, am I going to be okay with that? And am I going to be able to stand up for it, right? So that's the conscious that I'm always constantly making sure um, that I, I'm transparent in that sense. Um, you know, from that perspective, we are responsible for listening. And this is a two-way dialogue that, you know, there are for me, I love that it's audio. It lifts things off of words that are on Twitter that allows you to get behind it, to have the conversation and debunk some of the methods that might be out there. Um, you know, for, for me, social capital is everything. 
Like we need to get out and explain what it means before someone can make a decision. But with social media, things run off, right? And it just loses its means and people like read those words and it, it hits a specific audience. So for me, it's even the conversation around 2030 for Vancouver. And what does that mean? And I, you know, wanted, you know, for, for having that to be able to, for people to ask the question, you know, is, is it Vancouver? Or is it the region? What does this mean? And then just going back and forth. Um, I, I want to be that sanctioned lurker. I know that we used that at the beginning to be able to hear, but then to also stand up and debunk some of the methods of what people believe might be happening at council. And then for us to be able to correct it, or at least give the opportunity to, to voice the opinion. Well, I'm glad you brought up the 2030 um, movement because that was, you know, one of its core functionalities that we had with you where there's a group of us in Vancouver super eager and uh, listening to the fearless leader of, of, of John taking us in a direction and um, uh, TTG and, and Bart set up a, a clubhouse group on it, right, and convinced you to come on in and gave a platform for all of us to sort of speak our mind and then you helped spearhead that movement. So that to me, that's a perfect example of how this, this platform is being used to, to help our industry sort of have these conversations that would be a little bit more difficult, especially during a pandemic. Um, so first of all, thank you everybody for, for that. We've got about 10, 15 minutes more. I have a couple more sort of questions for here. Just a reminder to the audience that we are gonna transition to Clubhouse um, shortly and you can ask all of your questions uh, directly to the uh, panelists. But now that we've sort of gotten into it a little bit, obviously we've said here it is technically a social media app. Um, how do you, how does it differ though in your minds? Because to me, it certainly feels a lot different. Um, are we supposed to be looking at it the same way? Like, do we need to now go back to all of our, you know, our marketing mix and figure out how does Clubhouse fit into our strategy overall? Who wants to start that one off? Um, I might jump in just so I had a, a, a thought of how, for me, it's sort of replaced the the bar at the conference, right? The time of the of the day where it's that unconstructed conversation, you know, that it might flow here, there. <laughs> okay, nothing's gonna replace the bar, Mark. But <laughs> I'm so glad you said but, that. But you know, it just when I, the first few conversations that I got into is like, oh man, because it's flowing, it's synchronous, it it has context of you know the emotions in your voice, so you can emphasize, you can't really emphasize things in a tweet very well unless you're shouting with caps, but um, it, it just felt that way. Like you could, and, and the conversation might suddenly seg off to something else, which I know Mark can attest to, because. Well, <laughs> I think we have to ask Mark then, because is Clubhouse saving you thousands of dollars in bar bills then, Mark? <laughs> it's actually interesting because as I was listening to um, Tanya asking each other panelists their questions, I don't know why, but one thing that came into my mind was we're here to talk about Clubhouse, but really under the headline of sponsorship. And all of us who've worked in this business forever have for our entire lives been trying to convince brands that the power of live connection, that, that there is nothing more powerful than connecting with somebody in person. And I think, you know, we probably need to think about Clubhouse as really being just, you know, group voice chat, right? It's, it's one entry in a, in a technology. I think the interesting thing for me, you know, in hearing about how people in Vancouver don't, it's hard to get to know each other. So how do you build a, a club of creators? How do you find new people to join your uh, changing transformational work that I'm doing? You know, to Michelle's point, how do you create new advocates? I think for me, this is going to be a sector, but it's not about the app. I think Clubhouse might, to be blunt, be the one we remember, like, you know, it was the Ford of automobiles, but I think group voice, but I think it's real power is still to be seen, which is we can talk because I mean, I know three of you very well or relatively well, two of you really well. Um, and now we've met, but that human connection in person, I think is going to be an interest when we get that back, then how does group voice chat play in there? Because if you've met somebody, and we've all traveled the world and had a chance to do great experiences. So if you met somebody in Thailand or in Germany or in Scotland, that next group voice chat, it'll be like talking to a, a, a cousin. And so I think, you know, I don't think this is gonna replace the bar. I think it'll be the bar after the bar. Yeah, I, 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 did, I 
Definitely agree. And I think one of the comments that I've heard throughout is that the emergence of Clubhouse really sort of took off because of the pandemic. It was, it was a silver lining of it. And it's interesting to see, or will be interesting to see what its usage is like once we are back to, to person to person contact, hoping that that's obviously the case. But um, to Mark's point, let, let it, let's dive a little bit deeper into its specific partnership opportunities then. So how, how are we going to start using this? Like, do we start negotiating Clubhouse into our sponsorship conversations? Like, how do we see it engaging? Like, obviously, uh, there's a clear opportunity here for like, you know, um, brands, players, talent, leagues to be far more accessible in a very cost effective manner with, you know, low maintenance, as we talked about. So, you know, is, is that the next thing we need to start thinking about is like, you know, as part of my this sponsorship, I want access, you know, I want the after party on Clubhouse, I want, you know, a meet and greet on Clubhouse with this player, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I certainly think it helps you extend your activations, you know, to beyond, like if we look at the draft right now, you know, there's a way to to uh, to add that element to the mix, right? Um, by saying, well, okay, obviously everybody can't be here for a meet and greet with this uh, particular draft pick or, or coach right now, but we can extend that out to people who can't be here. Um, Michelle, what are your thoughts on like when you're actually trying to bring an event to Vancouver, let's just use you know, rugby sevens for a second. Um, how can we use Clubhouse after the fact? So only a certain amount of people can go to the games. Um, there's a whole bunch of corporate hosting. There's a bunch of stuff that happens. But is there a next stage here for whether it's the city or the organization directly to use Clubhouse to further engage with the actual event? Yeah, well, the beauty of Rugby Sevens is it's annual now, so we can build off of it every year, right? For me, it's going to be an idea developer. What worked? What can we do next? What grows from this? And so I constantly want that feedback from the community. You know, there's a lot of assumptions that I can make, and I want to make sure that I'm collecting a, a variety of voices in order to grow that. So for me, it's it's going to be able to reach out beyond because while it's the beauty of Rugby Sevens as sport, there's so much culture behind it. So how do I use the tool now to bring in the voices of the, the artists and the producers and the people that are going to grow the festival around it? And so, yeah, I, I see it as an idea developer and a conversation starter. For me, it's the pandemic, you know, we can't gather. So I can't go meet that person in person. <laughs> um, so this is another tool that is for sure useful right now. In the future, I would love to have the, the, the face to face, um, but this is where we're gonna be able to kind of keep growing our product or the input in order for us to make better decisions on what events we bring here, but also how we grow the ones that we have. Fair, so, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll send this one to Atif. Um, as, as marketers here, do you think we're actually in an advantage now using Clubhouse? Like, we think we know it all as marketers. Does that give us the advantage on how to creatively um, strategize to use this platform? Yeah, uh, definitely. And sorry, I was just going to go back to that first question, too. So uh, quick context. So Vancouver-based creators are at, like, 4.5K members now on the group. So we've actually had some brands reach out now. And some sports teams, like the Whitecaps, reached out as well. So I think the conversation that we're hearing even from those sides is that they just want some of the players to be able to talk directly to some of the fans. But uh, there's definitely room in the areas of like, even if it wasn't like Vancouver based creatives, like seeing all these large groups that brands could just go in and do their own rooms to start building that audience. Um, I think on a marketing side of things, like tiers are really interesting from like a digital marketing perspective, looking at Clubhouse, it's, it's running on Google like 2007 days, where it's not always about the title of the topic. It's more about like, what's the subject that people are searching up. So even right now, it's like for us, like we were able to grow pretty quick because we had Vancouver in our title. So when anyone was searching up Vancouver, the group just kept showing up. Um, so I think in those areas, that's like being a marketer for like, if anyone in here has been a marketer for like the last five, 10 years, they can really use those tactics to understand because it's, it's almost like SEO all over again. Um, so in, in those two areas, uh, and then I think the third area too is like um, Clubhouse and social audio right now is where TikTok maybe was about a year ago. Um, so it's almost like the early adopter stages where uh, there's still going to be a big growth, like Android still needs to come out. So it's a great time right now to grow tech because there seems to be a lot of users just actually just interested in the fact that there's a new platform that's growing. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how things play out. But I think the people that stay on Clubhouse really start to build an audience will 
definitely have a platform that's going to be an asset uh, going forward too as well. So we're near the end of this. We're going to transition to Clubhouse in a few months. I just, I, I, I'd be at a miss if I didn't talk about one more thing before we transition. To me, the, the most interesting part about Clubhouse so far is it's been the, the only app or the only social platform I've ever used that um, truly feels like it is a networking app. So I know LinkedIn was, you know, sort of that on the front end, but to me, Clubhouse has been a very, very organic uh, nature to it. I know Mark hates the word organic, so I apologize. I'll just keep using it over and over. But um, wh why is that? Like every time I'm in a room, I feel like people genuinely want to connect with others and help each other. Like I've never felt like that before. What is it about this app that's making that happen? Um, you know, one thing that I've loved about it is how much you're encouraged to read everybody's bios, like not just focus on the people who are speaking, but look through the bios. Um, and I think that's that's a really a, a really cool element of it that that makes it you know that gives it that um, that um, that aspect. I I would jump in and say, because it's the opposite of email, it's friendly. Uh, LinkedIn's not friendly. Messaging isn't friendly. Like how many times do you read something? And you know, a friend of mine likes to say you read email in the mood you're in. I think with Clubhouse, it's a much friendlier collegial. And I think back to kudos to Teeth's group building four, four and a half K. Um, there's really four and a half thousand creatives in Vancouver. I just want to understand that. Um, we all say we're creatives, we're not though. Yeah, but I just think that it is a much friendlier environment. And there is a, um, there, I think it's also pandemic related. There's a mantra of help, right? People trying to help. Like I, I, there's a guy in a room trying to do a documentary about his dad who was a pro wrestler who died at 56 due to alcoholism. And I've connected him to my buddy who owns the Fight Network, right? Like I've never met this guy in person. I don't think I would do that off LinkedIn. If somebody sent me a LinkedIn saying, I'm doing this documentary, will introduce me to a perfect stranger. I'd be like, hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point that, that um, the email phrase, Mark, because I think when you go into Clubhouse, you go in there with a mindset. You're you're like at, at this moment, I'm curious what's going on. So you're already approaching this medium differently than I think when you scroll through a Twitter feed or anything else. You're you're like, man, let me just shake things up or go see what's happening. Yeah. yeah. And I'd say like the audio helps me understand the tone and the context of which it's coming from that person. So, you know, Tanya, like us even connecting was through as much as we are in this industry in Vancouver together, we've never spoken at another event technically before. And I heard you expressing, you know, some critical, like positive criticism to some frustrations that are happening. And, you know, I reached out after because I heard it in context. I heard it genuinely. It wasn't words on writing. Like it wasn't, you know, a text that I read somewhere and you were ranting. And that's my interpretation from reading it. And I was like, I'm going to call you and reach out to you because I want to work through this so that you're part of the solution because like I need to hear the positives and the negatives and how do we fix this at the city and how do I then you know use your voice to be able to make the same points and frustrations that I have internally it's you know I, I agreed with what you were saying but as a staff person I, I'm only one person poking the person above me going hey guys we need to fix it and they're like not if it's coming from you, it needs to come from the outside, right? So that's where I'm able, you know, I heard your genuity and the voice of it at least, and I felt confident reaching out to you to say, let's take this further. Let, let me dive into this a little bit more and help solve that problem. Shocking to hear you say that I was possibly criticizing something. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you everybody. Okay, Mark, you wanna get a dig in? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, it's okay. Go I actually, this is not about you. It was actually the, the expression positively criticizing. I, I actually have never heard that before and I love it. Um, so I'm going to st steal it. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. thank you everybody. Tanya, I will take your criticisms for the rest of my career because they're, they're always helpful. Thank you. Um, I've just gone on to the app. I've launched our room. We're in here. So this is the time for everybody to open up their phones or their iPads. Join us and in about 30 seconds, we are going to transition over. Please think about some of your questions uh, you'd like to um, ask and we'll pull you up on stage. If you don't know how to be pulled up on stage, we'll walk you through all the etiquette of what happens on Clubhouse. Uh, thank you everybody. And this is the point I'm gonna sign off. See you guys on Clubhouse very shortly. <laughs>